Welcome to part two of Dr. Mel Chua's lecture on chemoradiotherapy for nasopharynx cancer, moderated by Dr. Sana Karam. This is a part of the RADLEX series of the RADOC Virtual Visiting Professor Network. In this second part of the lecture, Dr. Chua will begin to take a more forward-looking approach and discuss recent trials, in particular one of his own recent publications on allergen metastases. He'll then field some questions from the audience. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you know, I just, I, again, you know, want to take everyone around a full circle. And again, here I make uh, a reference to the, you know, a lot of the rings. Um, and, and if you're familiar with the part two of the Lord of the Rings, um, the two towers, and what you see here is you have induction um, on one side and you have adjuvant on one side. And we know what happened in the story. So, you know, is it time to discard you know, adjuvant chemotherapy, is there, is there no role for this at all in, you know, advanced MPC patients? And I'll, and I'll sort of bring everyone back as to why I don't think is uh, uh, this, you know, it's, it's, um, we should definitely tr throw this sequence string strategy out yet, as yet. So um, this is where I sort of, you know, just to show some sort of ideas whereby, you know, perhaps, you know, there are patients who will benefit. And it all points back to how we select them. So uh, J.C. Lin, again, you know, one of the you know, a, a renowned uh, international luminary in MPC, um, where, you know, he, he looked at, in a, in a, in a subset analysis from, uh, from a, a retrospective, retrospective cohort from Taiwan, whereby, you know, apart from just, you know, because we know the Sunyasin study looked at, you know, T3, 4, T3, T4, N positive and N2, 3 subgroup as, patients who are enriched for occult metastasis. Here they went a step further, whereby they look at even more high-risk criteria. Now granted, of course, you know, this is a retrospective analysis. Um, you know, they, they enrich for patients that, you know, we, we don't know how reliable this, you know, annotations are and whether application of these parameters are actually, um, you know, feasible in the trial setting. But, you know, he enriched for patients who are N3, so bulky neck nodes, patients with nodes going down the, the neck, T4 disease exclusively uh, on multiple nodes and, and with one to more than four centimeters. So these are somewhat, you know, uh, apart from N3 and T4, you know, some of these are, are arbitrary features. But he, he showed that uh, patients were able to receive at least two cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. In this subgroup of uh, adverse subgroup of patients, were able to see an improvement in disease control that corresponds to improvement in overall survival. But that um, the benefit was not you know, seen uh, for local regional control, I mean, as we would expect in the IMRT era. Now, interestingly, you know, and alluding to the point I made earlier about you know, how should we actually deliver adjuvant chemotherapy? Because we know that after chemo radiation, patients are wiped out and you know, more of adjuvant PF is just not going to, you know, cut it for patients. So, you know, and just to throw in this concept here of, could we actually give maintenance chemotherapy, but a very low doses? You know, and, and just, you know, to, to sort of um, whether these are actually tumorcidal or whether they, they evoke other um, molecular mechanisms that are anti, uh, that has anti-tumorcidal toxicity, um, you know, is, is unclear. Uh, but here in a adverse subgroup whereby we know that patients who recur, who had a detectable EDV DNA after chemo radiation, um, and these patients are at risk of recurrence, um, again, a study led by him, whereby they gave this low dose uh, UFT. So UFT is actually a, a, a uh, analog to capsidabin that we're more familiar with. And they gave patients low dose UFT for a year. They found that uh, this maintenance dose of chemotherapy was able to translate to an improvement in distant metastasis control. And uh, this again corresponds to an early, early survival difference. Now we know that the randomized uh, phase three trial from Hong Kong, uh, 0502 study of adjuvant Gensetabin cisplatin is negative, and I'll talk about it about it briefly. Um, but you know, in, I mean, this are uh, trial. I mean, this is data that actually throw this hypothesis that you know, perhaps in the right group of patient and the right strategy, and we are you know able to 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 deliver this therapy and still be able to, to salvage patients and be able to advance the bar, um, you know, uh, for survival. So um, I will point. Uh, both um, you all to these two trials uh, that are ongoing. So, um, you know, again, you know, we are fortunate to be involved in the first trial and the second trial, uh, again, you know, uh, we were 
fortunate to be involved in the conceptualization in terms of you know um, helping to shape how how the the strategy should be tested. But in a nutshell, uh, this trials compared two adjuvant strategies: one using high dose zeloda capsidabine for six months. Uh, and this was led by uh, Professor Zhao Tong and uh, Miao Jingjing, who is one of his uh, highly capable students. And then the other trial is led by Professor Juma, whereby they used a much uh, a 50% dose reduction of, uh, of capsidabine for a longer period of time. And, and you know, the way I, I would uh, I talk about this trial is I call it the tale of two cities, um, where, you know, you, when you, of course, I mean, at a, at a very broad sort of high level is just comparing two adjuvant strategies but there are slight nuances in a trial in terms of the patients that were recruited now uh in the first trial the it was i would call it a hit heart strategy you know um find a worst group of patients so here um we we actually enrich for a a very aggressive subgroup so uh, again the inspiration for this was uh, gain from looking at JC Lin's data that I showed earlier, the T4 disease subgroup, the N3 patients, you know, with high EV DNA titer. In addition, we also well, recruited patients with a bulky tumor, you know, more than 30 centimeter cube. Again, these are all, um, you know, uh, uh, hypothesis or, or, or rationales that were gained from, you know, some of the signals that we saw um, from, from retrospective analysis. And we also incorporated uh, PET scan as well. But essentially, if you have one of, of, of more of any of these features, and you will be eligible. And for these patients, they were treated with chemo uh, using the weekly regimen, and then they will receive a, um, a dose uh, a dose dense um, capsidabine for six months. So you know to 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 hit this patient's heart with more chemotherapy, examine the tolerability, and uh, and then see whether there's actually a difference in survival. Now, um, of course, it's complex. Uh, you know, when we, when we designed a trial, we realized that, you know, a feasibility was a, was a massive issue. Um, and, you know, we will eventually show data whereby it, it will also help us reconcile the, um, among all these adverse features, which uh, could we actually rank them in terms of importance. Uh, whereas in the trial by June Mai, it was a lot simpler, whereby patients receive, um, or were able to receive induction chemotherapy. So it was plus minus induction chemotherapy. Uh, all patients receive concurrent chemotherapy, and regardless of their EBV DNA titer, um, you know, patients are randomized to either metronomic capsidabine versus, versus observation alone. And the endpoint was again three year PFS. So uh, we will expect the data for these trials in 2021 and 2022. But um, prior to that, you know, just to you know, leave some thoughts here, I think. Um, we see competing strategies, and you know, although there are differences in the patients that were recruited, I, I know we are we're really curious to see how these strategies translate to the survival that we are going to see in terms of the relapse patterns, the disease trajectory. Because we know that when you give adjuvant chemotherapy, if it works, you know, one could see this delay of onset of metastasis and and how this curves will diverge. Um, would it be we still see the early divergence? between patients who will do well and patients who don't, uh, or will we see later recurrences? So I think, you know, the survival readouts of these trials will actually help inform us of some of the underpinning signs that are happening in this uh, advanced group of patients. And of course, you know, one could always argue that, you know, and it's important to be cognizant of, you know, is that when you are involved in, in clinical trials, you know, the, 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 the shifting Lens, uh, how quickly standard of care evolves, you know, would actually decide whether your trial, the results of your trial are actually relevant or not relevant. And I think, you know, as I was speaking to Sana uh, on countless occasions in terms of how we, you know, we're in the US, you know, HPV, you see this, you know, um, this onslaught of trials that were done in another viral associated head and neck cancer, HPV positive oral pharynx cancer. You, you will see the same thing as well, whereby, you know, um, with the emergence of rapid data from clinical trials and, and, and the center of care evolving with time, hopefully, then how do trials actually stay relevant and, and in terms of generating signs that are actually important and informative. Um, so, and this is where I will stop in terms of adjuvant chemotherapy. 
and I will, um, you know, present some of the more novel concepts. I think in terms of next generation, next generation trials um, that are largely focus on defining better groups and designing precision strategies to match the groups. And I think, you know, on top of that, it's important to know that, look, we are looking at a very high benchmark for phase three trials for MPC now, even for advanced stage three, four patients. And so if today I were to design an next trial that is based on induction chemotherapy, uh, induction chemotherapy and concurrent chemotherapy as a standard of care, now I'm looking at an 85% failure free survival and a 95% overall survival. And to do a trial like that would require to see, to run a trial that would, you know, yield a further benefit, you know, would require you know, a, a, a cohort that is like in the thousands. And, and then, you know, we start coming to the, um, to the, to the, to the un, uncomfortable zone of having large trials, a massive investment, and then not knowing whether at the end of it, do you actually see an improvement or conducting a large thousand of patient trial only to be told that an experimental treatment is negative. So, so this brings to mind uh, where we see EBB DNA featuring. Now, um, I made a short point about this earlier. I think the endemic, ver the endemic variant of nasal Frank's cancer is invariably associated with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, you know, and, and likewise, you see a similar emergence of oral pharyngeal cancers that's associated with human papillomavirus. Now, um, again, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't go into the details between how, you know, we, we might see this convergence of hand and neck cancers in the, S, in the West and the East, as I always talk about, because if you look at HPV oral pharyngeal cancer staging, the nodal staging certainly has converged to what we use um, for, for uh, EBV positive MPC. But uh, in fact, the other you know, um, nice little story was that Harold Vanshausen, the founder, I mean, the discoverer of, of HPV who won a Nobel Prize for it, was actually a mentee of Epstein, uh, John Epstein, and with Epstein and Barr, uh, they were the founders of Epstein Barr virus um, more than 50 years ago now. And this is a very nice timeline showing the association between EBV and its impact on, on tumor genesis. The, now, the, 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 the side story was why Epstein um, didn't win the Nobel Prize, but Harold did, was that they found a vaccine for HPV and we did not find an anti-tumor vaccine for EBV. But, um, you know, that's, that's a conspiracy theory that I will not go into. But, you know, this is a, it is this seminal paper that established this link, whereby we see here in the electron micrograph the presence of EBV uh, virons in the cytoplasm of uh, a, a patient with uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. So what actually happens is that, you know, for, for, um, EBV as it undergoes its latent phase of infection, uh, whereby we think that it's actually tumorigenic, exists as a circular um, form of, um, of, vi uh, of virus that exists in the cytoplasm. And, and this is the reason why we're actually able to detect EBV uh, DNA because um, you know it, it when the tumor when the tumor cells die, then we assume that this uh, virus particles are released and and they are then released from the cytoplasm and they are released in the blood circulatory system and they were then able to measure it. Um, now this is again seminal work led off by Dennis Slow, who was one of the pioneers for this test in our field um, more than twenty years now, whereby um, using, you know, PCR uh, based assay, he was able to show that uh, with a primer tag to the BAM H1 sequence of the virus, you're able to detect EBV DNA in nasopharynx cancer patients at baseline prior to treatment. Um, you'll see the, uh, the, the response, uh, the resolution of complete clearance of EBV DNA at the end of treatment. And then for patients at the onset of metastasis, again, you will see the re-emergence of EBV DNA. So, you know, it's a marker for diagnosis. It's a marker for tr uh, um, tracking of treatment response. And it also seems to be a marker for surveillance of disease and recurrence. And, and this is the case for both local, uh, distant, as well as local recurrence. Now, um, JC Lin nicely showed a few years later that um, patients with a detectable EBV DNA uh, at the end of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, 
essentially had a much worse survival. Uh, you can see here that patients uh, tend to have a much higher risk of relapse compared to patients who, a, who had a complete clearance at the end of uh, real therapy. So straight away, this was intuitive. Um, in terms of you know, helping us enrich for a group of patients who were at risk of distant metastasis. Um, this is the, uh, again, you know, they had sequential EBV DNA measurements just to bring you through this simple blood port. So they compared patients with a, a high EBV DNA titer of more than 1,500 copies and less than 1,500 copies uh, before treatment. Um, obviously, you have a higher load, predicts for high risk of relapse, but the difference is not as pronounced as at the end of treatment whereby you see that you really enrich for a group of patients who are at risk of distant metastasis. Um, measurements during treatment didn't seem to distinguish between the two groups, but we will see data later on that, you know, actually on treatment, uh, tr uh, surveillance would actually help inform on normal phenotypes uh, and prognosis. So this uh, was, um, you know, gave the, the motivation and rationale for the randomized phase two um, study, there's a subarm of the NRG, Agent 001. Uh, we are familiar with, you know, led by two giants, Nancy and Quinn. Um, and for this randomized phase two study, uh, there's a direct comparison between Osaraf against Gemsetabin and Texol. Uh, and we'll uh, uh, await this, this data. Now, um, you know, but just to, to, to sort of, you know, link back to where we think about uh, EBV DNA and, and how, how do we apply it in the ever shifting landscape with the shift towards induction chemotherapy. Now, um, without going into the details, we know that adjuvant chemotherapy had an issues. Um, this is uh, the study that I wouldn't discuss in detail, but just to, to emphasize, to, to sort of make my point, um, the, the NPC0502 study was led by Anthony from CUHK, whereby in patients who were aggressive, had a detectable EBV DNA after real therapy or chemo real therapy, patients were randomized to either six cycles of gemcetabine cisplatin versus observation alone. So one would think that here, you're pulling a very aggressive subgroup of patients, you're adding chemotherapy to them, and it would make sense to see a difference in survival. Now, to note that despite this, and despite using platinum and, and, and gemcetabine, where we know is slightly more tolerable, only 50% of patients were able to receive six cycles of, of chemotherapy, of, of the designed internal chemotherapy. And so, you know, we should actually start thinking, what about tracking EBV DNA response early on? So here to this point, I refer to this um, retrospective analysis from the Sun Yat-sen group uh, led by Professor Mai Hai Chiang, um, whereby they looked at a few time points. So here they had EBV DNA measured at baseline, at the end of induction chemotherapy, and at the end of chemo radiotherapy. Now you can see that even at an early time point whereby we match just we just stratify patients by their induction chemotherapy response alone. So you can see three groups here, patients who had a complete EBV DNA clearance at the end of induction chemotherapy, patients who did not have a clearance by induction but cleared at the end of chemotherapy, and patients who did not clear at all. As we expect, patients who had refractory, uh, who were refractory to such intensive treatment did very poorly. But even just looking at a very early response marker, we could tease out two very clean groups. And so that really gave the, um, you know, the, the, the motivation for this uh, you know, sort of larger study that we then went on to do and is now uh, published uh, last year in Nature Communications. Um, and here I again gave compliments to Suning for being such a great collaborator and Jia Wei, who is uh, one of the you know, excellent clinician scientists that work closely with us on this project. But in contrast to the earlier study, here we essentially measured and looked at EBV DNA clearance um, at every time point of treatment. So we had patients, um, you know, based on 10,000 patients, we, uh, you know, looked at only a subset of 700 patients who had EBV DNA measured after every cycle of induction chemotherapy midpoint of chemoradiotherapy, at the end of chemoradiotherapy. Now we make some very distinct observations. So um, the top plot here um, essentially is a very simple plot on proportion of patient with a detectable EBV DNA at each phase of treatment. So we made an observation that at, even after one single cycle, about 30% of patients actually demonstrate a complete clearance of EBV DNA. 
So highlights to us that there is a group of patients who are actually exquisitely sensitive to platinum and gemcitabine or Texol. Um, and again, we observed that you know there's about less than ten percent of patients who were is, who had treatment refractory disease, and we would coin them as clonally resistant. They could be radon resistant, they could, and also you know platinum resistant as well. Now, by the same time, um, we also observe that there are other diverse phenotypes. Um, that again, in the interest of time, I can't go into details here, but just to, uh, to mention a point, we actually observed that some patients had a complete clearance of EBV DNA. Um, and the majority of 70% of patients would have complete clearance after three to four cycles of induction chemotherapy. But some of these patients actually, again, manifest a detectable biomarker later on. So they get a complete clearance and then this re-emerges. And, and it, the time whereby this bounce occurs seems to relate to, again, a biological phenomenon, whereby we, we found that in the light purple plot here, the patients who had the early bounce, these patients actually you know, then went on to have a complete clearance later on. So it suggests to us that this is likely a false positive. But if the bounce occurs much later on, be it like, you know, during the chemo therapy phase, then this would again imply that, you know, as you're undergoing treatment, you're actually clonally selecting for a group of patients who actually had resistant disease. And, and we see this, Im this quick emergence of radio-resistant and platinum-resistant uh, MPC clones um, that actually was matched to how likely they're going to recur. So this is a the, the disease-free survival, illustrating the eight different phenotypes. Um, and the phenotypes here relate to the biological response phenotype, which means the rate of EBV DNA clearance as they're undergoing treatment. And you can appreciate the the apart from just this, you know, biological heterogeneity, that this biological heterogeneity was actually matched to survival. Uh, and to indicate a few points I made earlier, so the group one are patients who had a complete clearance very early on without demonstrating a bounce, and these patients do extremely well. Um, in the patients who had a persistent bounce, the group seven here, you can see in this red line. And so despite having a quick clearance early on, and when they reemerge much later on during the chemo therapy phase, these patients actually do very poorly. And you know, they actually do just as bad as patients who are clonally resistant. So again, you know, argues that you know this is a refers to a, a group of patients who probably had overlapping similarities in terms of being resistant to the therapies that were throwing at them. And then everybody else falls in between. So to simplify this plot, we did a very simple you know, biostatistical analysis whereby we try to cluster them based on their inter-subgroup comparison. Uh, and here we use the clinical endpoint of, um, you know, of hazard ratio for disease control. And uh, essentially we're putting out four distinct groups here. So the early responders where you can infer from the earlier plot I showed that this group does very well. And we argue that this group should be treated differently. Um, we have the intermediate responders, uh, whereby you know they they, they display um, sensitivity to uh, platinum and, and gemcitabine, and you know they they don't do as well as the early responders, but you know they they do okay. And then you have the delayed responders, which you refer to a group of patients who don't demonstrate clearance during induction chemotherapy, uh, but then eventually has complete clearance at the end of chemo therapy. So again, it's not an uh, implausible thing that these patients. Uh, wouldn't be as good as the former two groups. And then we have this treatment resistant group that comprise of patients who are, you know, clone, um, you know who, are, who are both radio resistant and platinum resistant. And when we then cluster them in this sort of biological phenomenon, we're able to see a much cleaner separation of PM curves uh, between these distinct phenotypes. And why this is important is because as we go forward, and I think in fact we can't claim to be the pioneer in this because the Chicago group actually, you know, what gave the inspiration for this trial um, was really the Optimus study that was done in the HPV positive oropharynx cancer led out by the Chicago group. Um, whereby, you know, here we are saying that by just measuring the induction chemotherapy response, uh, we are then able to stratify patients early and then, you know, design. To, um, 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 sort of individual arm trials uh, whereby we can then allow us to test specific hypotheses um, for the way we certify patients as well as for each group of patient depending on what we think the prognosis is what should be the appropriate strategy 
So, uh, um, you know, this trial has, has started. We have recruited our first patient. Again, kudos to the investigators from Sunni CERN, but this will be a multi-centered, uh, multiple, multi-centered umbrella single arm phase two trial, um, whereby, you know, we focus on the groups that are not, who don't, who don't perform as well. So the second line here are patients who don't display in early clearance. So they refer to the delayed responders um, and the intermediate responders where they get a clearance by the end of third cycles of chemotherapy that we argue that perhaps these patients, you know, they, they still have a, they don't display such a rapid clearance because they have a high tumor volume. And, and you know, we might, you know, either give them a center of care or consider adding sort of new drugs uh, that may perhaps replace this platin and try to mitigate toxicity. Now, we know that patients who don't clear by the third cycle, these patients do poorly. And this is our corresponding hypothesis that, you know, if they don't clear, um, it could be a result of the reemergence of, uh, of, of, you know, uh, resistant clones or the adverse subgroup, which are essentially chemo and radio resistant. And this is a group of patients where, you know, it provides a window of opportunity for us to actually test new drugs um, and be able to, you know, look for early drug signals that may help inform on, you know, uh, uh, phase three therapies or, or randomized phase two, phase three design. And how we actually designed uh, this trial was was um, was based on the assumption that if our strategy was correct in terms of selecting this group of patients, and our treatment strategy in terms of intensification is accurate, that for this overall group of patients, uh, we will actually hit a certain bar of three-year over uh, progression-free survival of above seventy-five percent. So the again. The idea for that came from a uh, the Roger Ahern so multi multi single arm phase two design. So I'll refer you again to this um, you know, great work done by Roger Ahern, which is which is a you know, creative and extremely intelligent biostatistician from the Institute of Cancer Research. But the 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 rationale for this design, for this trial it's important because you know in this landscape whereby we see such high benchmark for phase three trials. And if we were to you know, have a platform where we can quickly test hypothesis and look for normal drug RT combination, um, you know, as opposed to going with the conventional frequencies approach of you know, doing randomized phase two and phase three trial, and then you know having um, you know co committed large resources to trials, and then only to find that they are ineffective, as you have seen now in the immunotherapy and RT combination in HPV positive oropharynx cancer. I think you know this as one of other examples that we can start thinking in terms of, you know, umbrella trial designs, which actually have been primarily used in metastatic disease, but transferring this concept to advanced patient, uh, to, to, to advanced disease patients and then, you know, allow us to actually have such innovative platforms of testing uh, new combina combination therapies. So um, I, will, I, will, I will leave this final snippet um, where this is my own thoughts of where I think you know, we have come on full circle in terms of advancing therapies for nasal pharynx cancer. Uh, you know, I've touched on some of these highlighted strategies uh, uh, briefly um, in, across the duration of my talk. And then um, just as the final point of my talk, um, you know, the, the final story that I will share tonight uh, and early morning for you all is this uh, new data that we have in terms of how we actually are now able to then push the needle further in um, patients with metastatic NPC. So, um, you know, the quickly, I mean, the rationale for this trial, uh, you know, we have was was on the backbone of several retrospective studies, um, you know, from again from the U.S. looking at the SEER database and then also from China. Uh, but the 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 inspiration for the trial design uh, came from our observation of uh, this retrospective analysis that was done, uh, led by my fellow investigator, uh, Prof Chen, uh, from Sun Yat-sen, whereby he found that, you know, although we, we, we saw, you know, in, in this advanced group of patients with stage four disease who are chemo responders, that local real therapy to the primary actually enhanced uh, disease control and overall survival. Um, but it, we found that, in fact, in the, it was the patients who demonstrated complete response um, that actually benefited from consolidation local therapy. 
So, you know, again, these to the idea that, you know, um, perhaps chemo response could be a, uh, a way to select patients for this, uh, for more intensive local therapy later on. And there might be a convergence in terms of how uh, platinum and real therapy works for these patients. So that gave us, the, as I said, the inspiration for this uh, trial design. So this is a randomized phase three, uh, where our patients are screened um, at the beginning, at the point of diagnosis, and then they are tracked for, the, for their chemotherapy response to, to the first three cycles. And then um, based on the response to the first three cycles of chemotherapy, they're then randomized to either local re uh, real therapy um, or more, or just um, observation. Now, just to, to clarify here, chemo therapy actually doesn't refer to concurrent chemo therapy. Um, what then happens after three cycles of chemotherapy is um, patients, all patients continue to receive three more cycles of chemotherapy based on what they can, they can tolerate. And then at the end of six cycles of systemic therapy, they then receive either local consolidation alone or observation. So, so I think, you know, this is important in terms of how we, again, you know, sequence treatment such that it's actually tolerable because I believe that if we have, you know, front-loaded real therapy earlier on, then we might have ended up compromising on both the systemic therapy as well as local treatment. Um, uh, you know, the, the response rate were remarkable. Now, if you read the trial, you would realize that we actually did not use gem 7 cisplatin, but we used uh, PF um, as the... Uh, systemic therapy for this trial, and and that was that because the trial was designed preceding to the, um, the 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 phase three data from GP versus PF comparison, but we actually saw a very high response rate, and the reason was because the doses for the PF used in this trial was much higher. Uh, we've seen the results now. Uh, we saw this very dramatic difference in disease control, and that again translated to a very distinct difference in overall survival at a at a very early time point of even you know six months at a year 18 months and two years um, and so that that actually led to ethics um, the ethics committee which were, who were monitoring the, the, the trial and the DSMC committee to, to recommend stopping the trial early um, and you know he, this table summarizes the PFS data at six months 12 months 24 months showing this dramatic difference in disease control now you know of course, you know, when we see this, one could easily say, hey, this is obviously, you know, we expect this to be the case. You're treating the primary tumor. You expect that, you know, um, patients would have better primary tumor control. Um, but when we then looked at the first set of relapse, it is interesting that the local treatment did not just translate to an improvement in local regional control. So patients who were, treat were observed had a much higher risk of regional and local relapse. But in fact, it also reduced, um, resulted in a reduction of distant metastatic recurrence. So, you know, by this virtue of this data alone, it puts forth another sort of concept that we should, we should certainly test that does local therapy actually does anything to the trajectory of distant metastatic recurrence uh, for this disease? Now, um, to end, I'll leave everyone with this, with this um, you know, some of these concepts. I think, you know, after the, publish, the, the publication of this data, you know, I had several queries from, you know, uh, in fact, investigators from the U.S. asking, you know, what if we had ablated all the um, metastatic sites? You know, well, we did not, uh, I mean, was patients were stratified by the number of lesions, whether it was oligo or polycyte metastatic disease, but in this trial, um, the metastatic sites were not treated. In fact, when we went back to look at the data, in response to some of these queries, uh, only less than 15% in both arms had actually metastatic directed treatments. Um, there was another reason why SPRT was not used uh, to target the distant sites was because, um, you know, in, in China itself, uh, SPRT was not favorably reimbursed um, for, 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 uh, as a real therapy treatment. But, you know, with things that would have deferred, you know, we know the comment data saying that, you know, ablating on metastatic disease actually you know, further delay PFS and further uh, leads to survival advantage. Mel, you have one minute. Okay, I'm stopping. Um, so then the question is, are we, you know, are we curing patients here or are we simply kicking the puck down the line? And, you know, and, and alluding to the point I made, you know, are we actually altering the trajectory of metastatic disease? 
is front-loading treatment now only going to result in us dealing with more recurrent resistant clones at progression? And I point us to this uh, data that I think was a key piece of data from the updated comment analysis, where you see that you know, patients were treated with SBRT, but as those who were controlled, uh, observed, in terms of time of new metastasis, we do not actually see a massive difference. So lots to learn. Um, and uh, and I, I will stop here. I think thank you so much for listening. A few people that would really like to thank, um, you know, Zi Hui, who is a biostatistician from my institute, who, who is an excellent, uh, uh, again, one of the brainchild behind some of the trials that we, 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 we conceptualized, we were involved in. Um, and really have to thank all the collaborators locally, as well as the, the, the very collaborative uh, environment at Sun Yat-sen Cancer Hospital. And this is the, the, the my laboratory um, that is, you know, uh, a comprised of a, a vibrant group of, you know, young uh, investigators, male and female. And if you notice, this is Alex Lind uh, pre-COVID when he actually visited us last year. And I welcome any of you to visit Singapore, um, hopefully in the not too distant future. And thank you. Wow, that was remarkable, fantastic. Um, I'm gonna have to send you some steroid creams as a gift. <laughs> um, so um, this is great, very informative. I have a couple questions and then we'll take some questions from the audience as well. So okay. for the EBV, are you actually using EBV viral load to guide your therapy right now? Yeah, so so um, very good point. I think that the answer is, uh, a sh the, the short answer is no. Um, and in a way, yes to. Now, the, to your point, I think we view EBV DNA as a, um, as a semi-quantitative biomarker. Now, our test prior to, you know, before we um, were accredited as a recruiting site for NRG Agent 001, was not actually harmonized against the international standards. Uh, specifically, the test um, led out by Benjamin Pinsky from Stanford. So we undertook the painful process of actually harmonizing our test. And since then, uh, you know, we are much more confident about the read of our test. Now, but the thing is, you know, we are confident to say whether we see a yes or no. But then when you then think in terms of actually, you know, do we design treatment based on, you know, if a patient has a thousand EBV DNA copies, if a patient has a thousand five hundred copies, you know, we're not quite there yet. Because I think there's still variation uh, within patient in terms of the actual absolute number. Uh, because you know this is such a uh, it's actually a biomarker with a very short half life of four days, so um, so I think in terms of helping us decide um, do we intensify or didn't intensify yes, if we see that a patient has a EBV DNA of say three thousand at the end of chemotherapy induction chemotherapy has no EBV DNA biomarker then we interpret it that this patient is actually a extreme responder, and we actually look at you know whether can we 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 certainly do not reduce chemo dose, but we will look at whether could we actually, you know, sort of personalize the radiotherapy treatment, um, you know, reducing those to the primary, uh, you know, to spare some toxicities and, and so forth. And when you say harmonize, it means standardization. Is that like a certain PCR reaction or what? Yeah, it's a standard PCR reaction. So again, I'll refer you to the, um, to the residents, to the, to the seminal paper, uh, you know, in CCR seven years ago, 20, 2013, where they showed that it across four sites, uh, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Stanford, the variations to EBV DNA was observed between institutions as you would expect. And this variation was actually attributed to the PCR reaction, even the, the mix that was used, as well as the, um, the operator. So for us, um, I would say that actually prior to um, 2000, I think 2010 or, or 13, uh, our test was actually you know, our PCR reaction was against the MNR1 primer. So MNR1 is another sequence of the viral genome. And, uh, and then since then, we've transitioned to the BAMH1 segment. Uh, and then we've got a much more reproducible results. Do you see any kind of um, immune markers that are associated with it? Like, you know, is your mm. CD4 T cells more invigorated when yeah. you, I mean, you knew I was coming with that. Yeah. I mean, the Stanford yeah. group has published on that, the need for yeah. systemic therapy to get an effective immune, systemic immune response. So I, I would love to hear more about if there are any yeah. other correlates, like those that don't clear it, do they have persistent lymphopenia? Yeah. So, 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 um, you know, this is a fantastic question. 
And that's silly intuitive, right? Because, you know, but yet the naysayer will say, oh, how do you expect that to happen? Because you're looking at an immune response, which is complex, you know, multidimensional, um, whereas, you know, EBV DNA is, is simply just a, a, a tumor load biomarker. Now, um, the, but suddenly we, we know, you know, one hypothesis that we're actually testing now is that does the in, induction chemotherapy response um, and, and, you know, by judging that, we're looking at biological clearance of EBV DNA. You know, does it actually hint to the immune stimulation and the immune state of the patient? And, you know, to, 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 com to, to sort of, you know, complex, uh, complicate this matter. In fact, if you look at some of the early data, gemcitabine has potential immunomodulatory effects on the myeloid component, but which you know, you know, that is actually quite important in MPC. So, so I think that the hypothesis simply have to be tested. Um, we have data that I will I can't elaborate on. So we actually have a uh, a single arm phase, uh, phase two trial on double EP nevo in treatment refractory MPC patients after one line of platinum chemotherapy, and we seem to find that there's a relationship. Um, the data will be presented at ASMO Asia this year. Um, I don't know. I won't go further into that, but you know that that I think there's certainly a lot more that can be found because you know. The thing with immunotherapy now is we're trying to find a perfect biomarker, and then you you did a lot of work on that, and you know it's so complex, it's so hard, and and when you hear me talk about CPS score and PD one, you get annoyed, right? But you know if we can at least find some correlates that EBV DNA being a robust biomarker gives us some idea, then you know that would you know, yield novel trial designs and novel science in terms of how we think about sequencing immunotherapy strategies. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh a struggle for all of us. I think Brian has a question for you. I'll let him go and then I have a few more and let the audience also ask questions. Mel, fantastic talk. Hey, can you tell us what's the status of the EBV virus vaccine? Everyone's talking about another vaccine we're all hoping to see soon. Yeah, so so no, I mean, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, extremely thought-provoking question uh, and one that doesn't have a simple answer to. Now, to clarify my statement, I think, there is a vaccine, uh, so there's a GP350 vaccine um, for EBV. Uh, so it's not that there's no vaccine, but this vaccine is primarily specific to glandular fever. It's, uh, not, it, it's not an anti-tumor vaccine. So we know that EBV can induce uh, infectious mononucleosis, so the, uh, the, the GP350 vaccine is, is useful for that. Um, now, the thing is, we know that EBV is, is tumorigenic. Um, you know, Lawrence Young, Alan Rickinson from Rorick, they did a lot of work on incorporating EBV, uh, you know, in the, in the tumor genesis, genesis mode of an MPC. But we don't know whether, you know, it is required for tumor maintenance. So it's required in the early onset of tumor genesis. But once you're past that, you know, we, we don't know what actually helps maintain the tumor. So, you know, in their model, uh, and, and you can again refer to the uh, work by Kate and Bulo from CUHK, whereby they, they, they saw that we need the cell cycle checkpoint to be activated for uh, virus maintenance and so forth. But, you know, the, 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 the influence of EBV in the, lay, in the later phase of tumor genesis is unclear. So, so, so and, and so then, you know, when we then look at the latent peptides being, being expressed, like LMP1, LMP2, you know, again, it's not ubiquitous in every patient. So, so, so in that sense, it, it makes it very hard to find a target um, whereby you know you have a much clearer target in HPV. So, so I think you know for all these reasons, um, you know, one has not been very effective in terms of you know finding a vaccine. Now, there are vaccine therapies against EBV, um, and you know there are. You know, through a variety of strategies, um, you know, one that's been pioneered from Singapore is exposure of uh, adult, um, basically, uh, dendritic cells to EBV latent peptides like LMP2, LM, uh, LMP1. Uh, but you know, they they have any, if anything, efficacy in terms of you know uh, targeting frank tumors, but whether it's any value in preventing um, uh, 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 MPC, it remains unclear now. The third thing I will, I will mention here is that we don't know when does the infection matter. Um, you know, we know that this this infection is is endemic, and you know most of the young kids have it uh, you know, in, in the endemic parts of the world. So you know, if it's if it's due to early infection or not late infection, then you know 
people might, um, you know, with the right genes and, you know, the, the right HIV uh, genotype and having this uh, infection early on in life, you know, might have already set in the cascade the tumor genesis and therefore any vaccine might not be, might not uh, later on in life, may not actually reverse this process. Great answer. Uh, so for, as, as, you know, we're both radiation oncologists and I want to ask you in terms of adapting your radiation volumes. Um, it's, we've talked about this before in terms of the current standard care that's uh, published in the Green Journal. Have you, with the great data, the you know upcoming data that you just showed so elegantly, like we have a great response to induction chemo, do you adapt your volumes? Do you adapt your dose? What do you do rather than treating essentially whole head based on the atlases we have? So again, I have to be very careful here. Uh, you know, um, I think this is again my own personal anecdote. So I do. Um, now, what we do know is that even with IMRT, um, you know, high dose chemo radiation is not a toxic. Um, the, you know, the specifically with induction chemo. Now, with induction gem sediment cisplatin, you see that it's well tolerated. But then during the chemo therapy phase, we see a good amount of patients who actually demonstrate recall phenomenon. So they get uh, early onset of severe dermatitis, mucositis, uh, and that's the, the the beauty of gemcitabin. You know, it's a very potent radio sensitizer. Now, um, what we're beginning to do now is we're beginning to do pre pat um, that means pat at baseline. So that's pat is already incorporated in staging, and we do a pat uh, after three cycles of induction chemo, and you know, we look at the FDG uptake, and if we do see a good response, then now I know the conventional notion is that you treat the pre chemo volume to, to to full dose. Now, I still do that, but with regards to the microscopic disease, to the whole nasal pharynx, you know, I'm actually looking at dropping the dose um, because you know, reduction of volume, in addition to chemotherapy, you know, you're really looking at, um, you know, you're, you're trying to mitigate mucositis, uh, NG uh, feeding, G tube placements, um, and 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 just by you know dropping the dose, you actually spare you know um, doses to the to the oral pharynx. So I have dropped those to the whole nasal pharynx to 60, 66 grade, depending on response, uh, both EBV as well as PET. Um, and then you know we have also looked at you know what about PET residual areas. Um, you know I, I wouldn't. These are all again you know anecdotal, but you know would would boosting these areas, you know, which we consider to be resistant, uh, bring value to terms of local control. Now, all these practices that I cite are not without evidence. So if you look at closely in the details of the real therapy planning in the uh, chemotherapy trials from Sun Yat-sen, you'll realize that they actually use a different contouring method. So the, the dirty secret, in the, the, the elephant in this room is that no one uses the same real therapy uh, planning, although everyone shows very good local control rates. So in, in China, in Sun Yat-sen, they actually treat primarily the GTB to full dose, and then the microscopic disease gets a much lower dose, sometimes 64, 60 grade, 30 fraction, um, you know, and, and so, so I think, you know, and they've shown good control rates. So I think the, the bottom line is that tumors do recur, still recur in the high dose region. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we can actually potentially drop radiation dose. So now um, we've actually designed a phase three trial in collaboration with Sun Yat-sen, and that trial has started. It's called a reduced trial where we actually modify radiotherapy doses, um, dropping them drastically based on induction chemotherapy response. And you will like this idea. So um, we're not we're dropping doses not just to the primary, but also to the, to the neck itself. So because if you think about spreading the immune system, and you're thinking about combination immunotherapy, where we treat these large volumes in the neck, uh, in head and neck cancer, and we give, you know, um, even at bigger doses, 60 grade and 30 fraction, you're essentially going to wipe out all the immune cells, right, in addition to chemo. So we, in the responders, judged by EBV, we're actually dropping the radiation dose to the neck um, to, to 1.6 grade per fraction. I mean, to that same, um, you know, kind of uh, perspective, have you thought of emitting lymph node echelons altogether? I mean, that's really yeah. always the challenge for us because that's where you know dendritic cells are priming your t-cells and it's the 
not those lymph nodes that might harbor disease or are primary echelons, but those that have a low odd of response. Do you have you adapted your radiation or on no. the trial? Have you considered doing that? So, so on trial of trial, if you if you have N zero disease or if you have uh, you know low nodal uh, volume of disease, we actually do omit the lower neck. Um, so again, that's not uh, you know that's based on um, randomized phase two trial data as well as you know retrospective analysis. Uh, showing that in, in this patients, omitting the lower neck is safe because um, in NPC, certainly the, uh, the, the occurrence of skip metastasis uh, is quite low. Right. I mean, the other thing that we are struggling with as a field in general, whether HPV or EBV or, you know, any kind of head and neck cancer is, is it really the volume of um, neck that we treat the um, no. nodes or is it the, 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 now the emerging theme is the emer the resident T cells, um, that it's not all T cells are made equal. And there are some T cells that impart more of a cytotoxic phenotype. And those are the T cells that matter anyway, and tend to be radio resistant. And we should be very careful coming off, uh, the nodes. What's your perspective or your opinion on that? No, I mean, that's, that's great data. I mean, I, ref I presume you're referring to the data from, from Ralph. Uh, it was you know, nicely illustrated. Oh, I, I think, I mean, it's, 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 it's complex. I mean, I, I, uh, it's, it's a provocative and uh, hypothesis. I mean, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but you know, unfortunately, you know, when it comes to, you know, on a practical note, I think when we think in terms of, you know, pushing boundaries, you know, eventually when you get to the phase two, I mean, even the, yeah, the, even the phase two setting where you, you try to apply all these innovative concepts and you get this protocols through ethics uh, is a challenge. And are you collecting? Are you collecting uh, tissue and blood and all that? Yeah. So 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 we are. I mean, blood certainly. So we are collecting blood uh, from from patients. Um, we we certainly think that the the initial phase is important. So we have patients uh, who basically where, for which we have bank uh, T cells uh, pre uh, pre and then post every cycle of induction chemotherapy. Uh, we are working with a um, you know, one of our industrial collab partners. Um, looking at immune, immune phenotyping, looking at um, so using one of the tech to look ultra deep into the T cells in the circulating system to see whether uh, how does immune uh, Im uh, induction gem sediment cyst pattern alter the the immune landscape for each patient, and then also how does this match to the EBV DNA response? Uh, one question, other question: hypofractionation. You know, I'm a big fan. Um, where do you see that fitting in in the nasopharyngeal world? Yeah, so we actually do that. Um, so again, it's not uncommon practice. Uh, for me, in my practice, for there are two scenarios. Now, one scenario is actually you know in play right now, whereby um, in, in small T1 tumors, um, I, we actually give hypofractionation, not to the point, uh, you know, like above three grade per fraction, but we do give 68 and 30, 68 grade 30 fraction to the primary G alone. Uh, we have started thinking about, you know, uh, in patients who are treated with you know, upfront immunotherapy, uh, so uh, chemotherapy or chemo immunotherapy on trial, if they progress in the primary, uh, can we actually give uh, targeted uh, SPRT doses to the primary, uh, but in a very small volume? So we actually don't sometimes don't treat the whole tumor; we treat just the the center of the tumor alone. And I've, I can tell you, I mean, we've seen some dramatic responses that are unexpected. So I had a patient on trial, so he was on the double immunotherapy trial on EP Nevo. He progressed through after six months of immunotherapy and his progression was actually in the primary. So he had tumor that was invading the masticator space, the whole anterior nasal cavity was, was involved and I gave radiation. I gave simple good old 50 and 20. And after the, the third or fourth fraction, the whole tumor melted. Literally, he, he could breathe again. You know, we saw dramatic response on CBCT, we were completely dumbfounded. We took tissue, of course, um, but the, 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 thing, the, the thing that I did, which, you know, on hindsight, I kind of regretted was I continued through the real therapy and he eventually developed very severe ORN. So the whole mucosa was wiped off. He suffered from intractable head pain, which, which we thought was due to metastasis. And then we did an MRI and we realized it was actually osteoretinal necrosis. Um, and, and yeah, it was, um, you know, it, it, so, you know, apart from the, the, the clinical tragedy, but, you know, like patients like this, these extreme responders, you know, confirms to us that there's a synergy between 
real therapy and immunotherapy and how we deliver it, um, you know, it's, 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 it's really going to play a part. I think, you know, what you alluded to, it's, it's, it's worth testing. Um, other questions from the audience? We're at nine o'clock or anybody? I could go on forever and I'll bug you in other ways, but this was fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully soon, post COVID. Likewise. All right. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. And have a nice, have a nice day. Have a nice weekend. Have, have a nice night. Bye-bye.